I'll just say a few words of introduction very, very briefly. I think everyone here to varying degrees has already encountered the figure of Frederick Schiller. Um, we've either read his works, we've read about him, uh, but regardless, there has been a sense of this figure playing a very important role in recent history, um, especially uh, coming out of this really revolutionary period of potential internationally that was sparked by the American Revolution. And Frederick Schiller himself uh, is known as the poet of freedom. He is German, part of the, the Weimar classical um, revolutionary process. Goethe was another member, but there were a lot of these incredible German poets. Schiller was the shining light. Um, and when you read his poetry, I know Dave has published some of the translations of Schiller's best works onto uh, the Chain Muse. We've got, we've got a lot of essays about Schiller on the Rising Tide Foundation. But when you read it, you get a real sense that here's somebody who has a faith in a better humankind that is in our destiny and that it's the role of great artists and also scientists uh, who really are just two parts of the same of the same process and that's why Schiller was also working with people like Alexander Humboldt uh, you know and Humboldt's brother the big educational reformer of Germany Wilhelm um, and many other scientists who were bringing in a, a quality of thinking that would that fused aesthetics, creative, a creative sense of beauty, a moral purpose with discoveries in the natural field of sciences, but also in new ways of expressing higher powers of beauty in poetry, in literature, in drama, in music. Uh, Beethoven being one of the greatest examples who chose to use Schiller's work um, as his point of inspiration. It took him maybe 30 years, I think, as, as far as I've read, to finally find the proper expression uh, musically to Schiller's Ode to Joy, but he finally did it in the form of the Ninth Symphony and many other examples. So this is something which is really powerful, but one of the, the lesser appreciated parts of Schiller's work and his life, what he contributed and brought to humankind, um, is found in his work on universal history. And so this is something which is not utilized, I mean, it's not taught in school today at all. If you want to study history, you're not going to learn about this method. Now this method, the the sad fact is that if you did learn about this method and were allowed to start utilizing it, regardless of what uh, part of history you chose to begin looking at and what part of the world, whether it was India in the 1930s or a thousand years or 2000 years in the past or whatever period, or whether it was China or whether it was Germany or whatever part of the world in space or time, you would have a method of quickly using that as a master key to find the universal expression that shapes all all history regardless of where and when we live um it is based on a, a, a non dichotomization of past and future and present whereas current history as as it is taught treats things treats the the field as a study of the past isolated from the present or the future that's part of the reason why people um tend to not identify the principles of tragedy that they're walking right into again and again and again, which litter history, right? It's the repetition of past foolish errors and the inability to identify our own position subjectively within that objective flow of history. So by, by virtue of the fact that people are ignorant to this and haven't been given that access, we are moving like lemmings into an otherwise completely avoidable destination. Um, so Schiller, again, great example of somebody who provides many, many cures on so many levels for so many of the ills that plague us. And so we've picked three, uh, Cynthia and I just looked at the, the best three universal history lectures uh, available. Um, it's kind of a miracle that even these few that we do have available exist because he never wrote them down. These were just really sharp students in his uh, audience when he was teaching at Jena University who had the wits to actually take really good notes and compose them into um, transcripts. So we're going to start with the what is and to what end do we study universal history, which was his inaugural lecture at Yena. I think it was in 1792, but we'll correct that when I when we open up the text. Next week, we'll read um, probably the mission of Moses. And then following that, we'll read uh, the constitutions of Lycurgus's Sparta versus Solon's Athens, um, which should round it out. I, we might want to maybe read one more item by Schiller. I'm not too sure, but I think after that, we'll maybe look at some Shelley and then maybe some Vernotsky 
um, in the coming weeks. So let's start with that. So today, I think we could definitely get this one reading done. Um, if we need to stop at any point, like usual, feel free to just stop, ask a question, maybe you know, share a thought if it comes to you. Uh, but otherwise, we'll try to we'll try to push through it. Um, so let me do a screen share. All right. So yeah, what is and to what end do we study universal history? Translated by Caroline Stephan and Robert Trout. And it says here on May 26th, 27th, 1789. Ah, yes. Okay. So this is right at the moment that the French Revolution was, uh, it hadn't yet begun. Um, this is just a, a few weeks before the tennis court oath in France. Uh, so there's still a lot of potential that the French Revolution was not going to turn into a Jacobin bloodbath at this time. The great, you know, the Ben Franklin network had not had their heads cut off yet. Um, so there was still a fight over whether this was going to be the gateway for uh, the overthrow of hereditary structures of political power in Europe, which was always the objective, was to replicate the better uh, aspects of the U.S. Revolution inside of first France. And if it was successful there in you know, we saw the, the same networks ready to mobilize in Poland, in Germany, uh, Prussia, and Spain, and other places. So, yeah, 1789 is an important thing to keep in mind. Schiller is very much in tune with that. He's part of these networks, so always good to have that context. Uh, so it says here, Schiller delivered this lecture on universal history at Jena University. It was his first lecture in his new position as professor of history, a post which Goethe had arranged for him, though without compensation. Oof in January of that year. The young Schiller's reputation was already such that for his first lecture, the classroom was filled to overflowing. A virtual march of hundreds of students occurred in the streets, much to Schiller's amusement, to secure a larger classroom before Schiller could begin. Okay, all right, that's the context. So who would like to uh, read? I, we probably have just, I think, probably two readers today, 10 pages each, uh, thereabouts. Uh, so who wants to start? Kevin, I guess you're driving, so that's probably a no-go. Um, do I volunteer somebody? Oh, Cynthia can vote. Can you read? No, you just have to put the mic by me. Okay, all right, Cynthia will read. Uh, gentlemen, it is a delightful and honorable commission for me to wander into the future at your sides through a field which reveals so many objects of study to the thinking observer. Such magnificent examples for the emulation of the active worldly man, such important explanations for the philosopher, and such rich sources of most noble joy for everyone without exception the grand and broad field of universal history. The sight of so many splendid young men gathered about me by their noble thirst for knowledge and whose mitts and in whose mitts some genius flourishes who will make himself felt in future ages transforms my ob obligation into pleasure, but also makes me feel the weight and importance of this enterprise in its full force. The greater the gift I must bequeath upon you, and what greater gift than truth has any man to give to men? The more I must take caution. That its value is not debased in my hands. The more lively and pure your spirit conceives in this happiest epoch of its activity, and the quicker your youthful passions glow, the greater the demand upon me to prevent this enthusiasm, which only truth has the right to awaken, from being wasted unworthily by fraud and deception. The field of history is fecund and vastly encompassing. In its sphere lies the entire moral world. It accompanies us through all the conditions mankind has experienced, through all the shifting forms of opinion, through his folly and his wisdom, his deterioration and his ennoblement. History must give account of everything man has taken and given. There is none among you to whom history hath nothing important to convey. However different the paths toward your future destinies, it somewhere binds them together. But one destiny you all share in the same way with one another, that which you brought with you into this world, 
to educate yourself as a human being, and history addresses itself to this human being. But, gentlemen, before I can undertake to determine more exactly your expectations of this object, of your diligence, and to explain its connection with the real purpose of your diverse studies, it were not superfluous for me to first reach agreement with you on that purpose of your studies. A preliminary clarification of this question, which seems appropriate and worthwhile enough to me, at the beginning of our future academic relationship, will enable me directly to draw your attention to the most dignified side of world history. The course of studies which the scholar who feeds on bread alone sets himself is very different from that of the philosophical mind. The former, who for all his diligence is interested merely in fulfilling the conditions under which he can perform a, vo a vocation and enjoy its advantages, who activates the powers of his mind only thereby to improve his material conditions and to satisfy a narrow-minded thirst for fame. Such a person has no concern upon entering his academic career. Most important than distinguishing most carefully those sciences which he calls studies for bread from all the rest, which delight the mind for their own sake. Such a scholar believes that all the time he devoted to these latter, he would have to divert from his future vocation and this thievery he could never forgive himself. He will direct all of his diligence to the demands made upon him by the future master of his fate, and he will believe he has achieved everything once he has made himself capable of not fearing this authority. Once he has run his course and attained the goal of his desires, he dismisses the sciences which guided him, for why should he bother with them any longer? His greatest concern now is to display these accumulated treasures of his memory and to take care that their value not depreciate. Every extension of his bread science upsets him because it portends only more work or it makes the past useless. Every important innovation frightens him because it shatters the old school form which he so laboriously adopted. It places him in danger of losing the entire effort of his preceding life. Who rants more against reformers than the gaggle of bread-fed scholars? Who more holds up the progress of useful revolutions in the kingdom of knowledge than these very men? Every light radiated by a happy genius, in whichever science it be, makes their poverty apparent. Their foils are bitterness, insidiousness, and desperation, for in the school system they defend, they do battle at the same time for their entire existence. On that score, there is no more irreconcilable enemy, no more jealous official, no one more eager to denounce heresy than the bread-fed scholar. The less his knowledge rewards him on its own account, the more he devours a claim thrown at him from the outside. He has but one standard for the work of the craftsman, as well as for the work of the mind, effort. Thus, one hears no one complain more about ingratitude than the bread-fed scholar. He seeks his rewards not in the treasures of his mind. His recompense he expects from the recognition of others, from positions of honor, from personal security. If he miscarries in this, who is more unhappy than the bread-fed scholar? He has lived, worried, and worked in vain. He has sought in vain for truth, if for him this truth not transfer itself into gold, published praise, and princely favor. Pitiful man, who with the noblest of all tools, with science and art, desires and obtains nothing higher than the day laborer with the worst of tools, who in the kingdom of complete freedom drags an enslaved soul around with him. Still more pitiful, however, is the young man of genius, 
whose natural, beautiful stride is led astray by harmful theories and models upon this sad detour, who was persuaded to collect ephemeral details for his future vocation so wretchedly meticulous. His vocational science of patchwork will soon disgust him. Desires will awaken in him which it cannot satisfy. His genius will revolt against his destiny. Everything he does appears to him but fragments. He sees no purpose to his work, but purposelessness he cannot bear. The tribulation, the triviality in his professional business presses him to the ground because he cannot counter it with the joyful courage which accompanies only the enlightened understanding, only expected perfection. He feels secluded, torn away from the connectedness of things, since he has neglected to connect his activity to the grand whole of the world. Jurisprudence disrobes the jurist as soon as the glimmer of a better culture casts its light upon its nakedness. Instead of his now striving to become a new creator of law and to improve deficiencies now discovered out of his own inner wealth, the physician is estranged from his profession as soon as grave errors demonstrate to him the unreliability of his system. The theologian loses respect for his calling as soon as his faith in the infallibility of his system begins to totter. How entirely differently the philosophical mind comports itself. As meticulously as the bread-fed scholar distinguishes his science from all others, the latter strives to extend the reach of his own and to reestablish its bond with the others. Reestablish, I say, for only the abstracting mind has set these boundaries, has sundered these sciences from one another. Where the bread-fed scholar severs, the philo philosophical mind unites. He early convinced himself that everything is intertwined in the field of understanding as well as in the material world, and his zealous drive for harmony cannot be satisfied with fragments of the whole. All his efforts are directed toward the perfection of his knowledge. His noble impatience cannot rest until all of his conceptions have ordered themselves into an organic whole, until he stands at the center of his art, his science, and until from this position outward he surveys its expanse with a contented look. New discoveries in the sphere of his activities which cast the bread-fed scholar down delight the philosophical mind. Perhaps they fill a gap which had still disfigured the growing whole of his conceptions, or they set the stone still missing in the edifice of his ideas, which then completes it. Even should these new discoveries leave it in ruins, a new chain of thoughts, a new natural phenomenon, a newly discovered law in the material world overthrow the entire edifice of his science, no matter. He has always loved truth more than his system, and he will gladly exchange the old in sufficient form for a new one more beautiful. Indeed, if no blow from the outside shatters his edifice of ideas, he himself will be the first to tear it apart, discontented to reestablish it more perfected. Through always new and more beautiful forms of thought, the philosophical mind strides forth to higher excellence, while the bread-fed scholar in eternal stagnation of mind guards over the barren monotony of his school conceptions. There is no fairer judge of the merits of others than the philosophical mind. Shrewd and imaginative enough to make use of every activity, he is also equitable enough to honor the creation of even the smallest contribution all minds work for him. All minds work against the bread-fed scholar. The former knows how to transform everything around him, everything which happens and is thought into his own possession. Among thinking minds, an intimate community of all goods of the mind is in, in effect. And what is obtained in the kingdom of truth by one 
is one for all. The bread-fed scholar fences himself in against all his neighbors, whom he jealously begrudges light and sun and keeps worried watch over the dilapidated barrier which but weakly defends him against victorious reason. For everything the bread-fed scholar undertakes, he must borrow incentive and encouragement from others. The philosophical mind in his diligence finds in his subject matter itself his incentive and reward. How much more enthusiastically can he set about his work? How much more lively will his eagerness be? How much more tenacious his courage and his activity? Because for him, work rejuvenates itself through work. Even small things become grand under his creative hand because he always has the grand objective, which they may serve in view while the bread-fed scholar sees even in great things only that which is petty. It is not what he does, but how he treats what he does, which distinguishes the philosophical mind. Wherever he may stand and work, he always stands at the center of the whole, and however far the object of his labors may draw him away from his other brothers, he is allied with them and near them through a harmonically working understanding. He meets them where all enlightened minds find one another. Should I now carry on further in this description, or may I hope that you have already decided which of these two portraits I have held up to you here you will want to take as your model? Whether the study of universal history can be recommended to you, or whether you should leave it alone, depends upon the choice you have made between these two. My only concern is with the second portrait, for by endeavoring to make oneself useful to the first, science might depart too far from its higher, ultimate aim and might purchase a small profit with a sacrifice too great. If we are agreed upon the point of view from which the value of science should be determined, I can now draw closer to the conception of universal history itself, the topic of today's lecture. The discoveries which our European mariners have made in distant oceans and on remote coastlines present us a spectacle as constructive as it is entertaining. Go on. They show us tribes which surround us at the most diverse levels of culture, like children of different ages gathered around an adult, reminding him by their example of what he used to be and where he started from. A wise hand seems to have preserved these raw tribes for us down to our times, where we would be advanced enough in our own culture to make fruitful application of this discovery upon ourselves and to restore out of this mirror the forgotten origin of our species. But how shaming and sad is the picture of these people, uh, and sad is the picture these people give us of our childhood. And yet the level at which we see them is not even the first. Mankind began even more contemptuously. Those we study today, we already find as nations, as political bodies. But mankind first had to elevate itself by an extraordinary effort to political society. Now, what do these travelers tell us about these savages? They found some without any knowledge of the most indispensable skills, without iron, without the plow, some even without the possession of fire. Some still wrestled with wild beasts for food and dwelling, among many language, had been scarcely elevated from animal sounds to understandable signs. In some places, there was not even the simple bond of marriage, as yet no knowledge of property, and in others, the flaccid soul was not even able to retain an experiment, experience which repeats itself every day. One saw the savage carelessly relinquish the bed on which he slept because it did not occur to him that he would sleep again tomorrow. War, however, okay. War, however, was with them all, and the flesh of the vanquished enemy was not seldom the prize of victory. Among others, acquainted with various leisures of life, 
who had already achieved a higher level of culture, slavery and despotism presented us a dreadful picture of them. Once we find a tyrant in Africa trading his subjects for a gulp of brandy, another time they would be slaughtered on his grave to serve him in the underworld, where one's pious simplicity prostrates itself to a ridiculous fetish, another time it is to a terrible monster, mankind portrays himself in his gods. Where over there we see denigrating slavery, stupidity, and superstition bow him down, yet another time we see him utterly miserable on the other extreme of lawless freedom, always armed for attack and defense, startled by every noise, the savage strains his cautious ear into the desert. Everything new is the enemy, and woe to the stranger whom a storm has cast upon the coast. No hospitable hearth will smoke for him, no sweet hospitality comfort him, but even where mankind has elevated itself from hostile solitude to community, from privation to luxury, from fear to joy, how bizarre and atrocious he seems to our eyes. His crude taste seeks joy in stupor, beauty in distortion, glory in exaggeration. Even his virtue awakens horror in us, and what he calls his bliss can only arouse our disgust and pity. So were we. Caesar and Tacitus found us not much better 1800 years ago. What are we now? Let me linger for a moment at this epoch in which we are now living, at this present shape of the world we inhabit. When he says Caesar and Tacitus found us not much better 1800 years ago, is he referring now to the he, German people, uh, the Germanic people? That, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, you want to scroll down? Yeah. More? Human diligence has cultivated it and subdued the resisting land through persistence and skill. In one part of the world, we see that mankind redeemed the land from the sea. Somewhere else, he opened rivers into the arid land. Mankind has intermingled the regions and the seasons and has toughened the weak plants of the Orient to his own harsh climate. As he brought Europe to the West Indies and the South Seas, so he also let Asia arise in Europe. A merrier sky now laughs above Germany's forests, which the powerful hand of man tore open to the rays of sunshine, and in the waves of the Rhine are mirrored Asia's grapevines. Populous towns arise on its banks, which swarm with vigorous life of pleasure and work. Here we find a man secure in peaceful possession of his acquisitions among millions of others, whom previously a single neighbor had robbed of his slumbers. The equality he lost upon entering the community he regained through wise laws. He escaped from the blind constraint of pure chance and poverty under the more gentle constraint of treaties and surrendered the liberty of the beast of prey to redeem the more noble freedom of the human being. Prevailing need compels him no longer to the plowshare. No enemy any longer demands of him that he leave his plow to defend home and fatherland on the battlefield. With the arm of the husbandman, he feels his barn, fills his barns. With the weapons of a warrior, he protects his territory. The law keeps watch over his property, and that invaluable right remains for him to decide for himself what his duty is. How many creations of art, how many wonders of diligence, what light in all fields of knowledge, since man no longer consumes his energies in pitiful self-defense, since it has been placed at his discretion to reconcile himself with need, which he ought never fully to escape, since he has obtained the valuable priv privilege to command freely over his capabilities and to follow the call of his genius. What lively activity everywhere, since desires multiplied, lent new wings to inventive genius and opened new spheres to his diligence. The boundaries are breached with which isolated states and nations in hostile egoism. All thinking minds are now bound together by the bond of world citizenry, and all the light of the century 
can now illuminate the spirit of a new Galileo and Erasmus. Since the time when the laws descended to the weakness of man, man too accommodated to the laws. With them, he has become gentle, just as he ran wild when they were wild. Barbaric crimes follow their barbaric punishment gradually into oblivion. A great step toward ennoblement has taken place, so that the laws are virtuous, although mankind still is not. Where duties enforced upon mankind are relaxed, morality takes command of him. Whom no punishment terrifies and no conscience curbs is now held within bounds by laws of decency and honor. It is true that some barbaric remnants of the former age have penetrated into our own, the progeny of accident and violence, which the age of reason should not perpetuate. But how much which is useful has the understanding of mankind also given to this barbaric legacy of the ancient and middle ages? How harmless, yes, how useful, it has often made that which it could not yet dare to overturn. Upon the rough terrain of feudal anarchy, Germany established the system of its political and clerical freedom. The silhouette of the Roman emperor presented on this side of the Apennines serves the world infinitely better than its dreadful archetype in ancient Rome, for it holds together a useful system of states through concord. I guess he's referring to the, the Holy Roman Empire, right? Of like Maximilian. Versus the ancient? Yeah, the ancient Roman czar. Like, it's not like the old Caesar system of right. ancient Rome, but the, the Holy Roman Empire is like where all of Germany yeah. before it became a nation was, was all of Yeah. The Were there some decent uh, Roman emperors that actually like in, really helped industry and things like that? The own one or the German one? You're talking about the, the Roman, the ancient one or the German one? No, the German one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Friedrich Hohenstaufen, for example. Who? Frederick. The Friedrich uh, Hohenstaufen. That's, that's Frederick the first, right? No, that's the second. The second. Well, the first was also a good one. Well, well, I, I, I'm sorry. The Both are Hohenstaufen. Really good, yeah. yeah, well, both are of the same family, so they both are Hohenstaufen, but the second was, uh, well, the first one is the one who went to the crusade, okay, at the same time than Richard Lionheart uh, with the red beard. In French, it's Barberhus. I don't know in English, you call that Frederick the red beard or, anyway, the one that I wanted to stress is the second one, Frederick the second, and uh, he was truly a shining sovereign. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, perceive a little bit like a uh, someone uh, quite suspect by the Catholic Church because he was quite close to the Muslims, for example. But mm -hmm. it was more for their mathematics and their astronomy, and it's not for uh, he was perfectly Christian and Catholic. He was interested by the Muslims because of their science at the time. Mm -hmm. And a small detail, he was born by Caesarian, and the doctor who performed the Caesarian was an Arabic person, was an Arab. Oh, so he, he, might, he would have died otherwise? Oh, absolutely. Well, we, we, we're not sure because after all, things might have happened otherwise. But uh, the fact that he was born by Caesarian, performed by an Arab doctor, yeah, I suppose yeah. that it it yeah. oriented a little bit his favorite words, the mm -hmm. Muslim word. Mm -hmm. That's, it, yeah, yeah, emphasize oriented <laughs> uh, to the orient. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry. It, uh, was, uh, the, the, uh, it was an intended matter. I congratulate you to uh, having Never, understood. <laughs> I've got a second quasi maybe pun uh, stupid question because you just brought up Caesarian section. Does that have anything to do with Caesar? <laughs> oh yes, absolutely, sword, absolutely. Right? It does, right? Uh, no, no, no. You, 
you're, you're right to ask the question because according to legend, we don't have an absolute proof, but apparently uh, Julius uh, Caesar was born by Caesarian. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. That's actually much more interesting than I expected. Great. All the cool kids are doing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the former had suppressed the most active forces of mankind in slavish uniformity. Even our religion, so much distorted at the hands of the faithless, from which it has been handed down to us, who can deny the ennobling influence of a better philosophy in it from Leibniz's and Locke's? He's being diplomatic. It wasn't so okay. much back then. Not Locke's, <laughs> only Leibniz's. The dogma, Relax, and moral <laughs> the dogma and morality of Christianity gained in the same way the brush of a Raphael and Correggio? Corid I can't yeah. say that. Bequeathed yeah, it's Correggio. Correggio. Bequeathed to sacred history. Finally, our nations, with what intensity, you're looking him up as a painter? <laughs> Finally, our nations, with what intensity, with what art they are entwined with each other, how much more durably fraternal through the charitable force of need than in earlier times through the most ceremonious treaties. The peace is now guarded by a permanently bridled war, and the self-love of one nation makes it the guardian over the prosperity of the other. The European community of states appears to be transformed into a great family. The family members may treat each other with hostility, but no longer tear each other from limb to limb. <laughs> What? Hitler would be so sad to see modern Europe. Well, they're still not tearing each other from limb to limb, but they're not, not in brutal not warfare. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I approve Matthew. Not <laughs> <laughs> what very different pictures. Who would suspect in the refined European of the 18th century only an advanced brother of the modern Canadian or the ancient Celt? All these skills artistic impulses, experiences, and all these creations of reason were implanted and developed in mankind during the span of a few thousand years. All these wonders of art, these grand achievements of diligence evoked from mankind. What awakened them to life? What enticed them forth? Through which conditions did man wander until he ascended from one extreme, from the unsociable troglodyte to the ingenious thinker, the cultured man of the world. Universal world history gives the answer to this question. So the next person. Okay, who wants to pick it up? I can read. Do it. Um, hang on, I was just rereading something. We're at the, these same people present themselves? Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Because I'm on my phone and I'm staring at a screen. It's okay, what about uh, Juan De Declan? Can you guys hear uh, Dave okay? Yep. You're good to go. In second. These same people present themselves on the same tract of land so immeasurably different when we view them in different periods of time. No less striking is the difference offered by the contemporary generation in different countries. What a multitude of customs, constitutions, and manners. What a rapid alternation between darkness and light, between anarchy and order, bliss and misery, even when we meet people only in the small part of the world, Europe. Free at the Thames, and for this freedom his own debtor, here unconquerable between the Alps, somewhere else invincible between his artificial rivers and swamps. At the river Vistula, without energy and miserable in his discord, on the other side of the Pyrenees, without energy and miserable in his calmness, wealthy and blessed in Amsterdam without harvest, poor and happy in the unused paradise of the Ebro, 
Here two distant nations, separated by an ocean, transformed into neighbors by force of necessity, diligence of arts, and political bonds. There are adjacent residents of one river, immeasurably distant in their different liturgies. What led Spain's power across the Atlantic Ocean into the heart of America, and not even across the Tajo and Guadiana? What preserves so many thrones in Italy and Germany, and in France let, in France let all, except one, disappear? Universal history solves this question. Even that we found ourselves together here at this moment, found ourselves together with this degree of national culture, with this language, these manners, these civil benefits, this degree of freedom of conscience, is the result perhaps of all previous events in the world. The entirety of world history, at least, were necessary to explain the single moment. For us to have met here as Christians, this religion had to be prepared by countless revolutions, had to go forth from Judaism, had to found the Roman state exactly as it found it, to spread in a rapid and victor victorious course over the world, and to ascend finally even the throne of the Caesars. Our raw forefathers in the Thuringian forests had to have been defeated by the superior strength of the Franks in order to adopt their religion. Through its own increasing wealth, through the ignorance of the people, and through the weakness of their rulers, the clergy had to have been tempted and favored to misuse its reputation and to transform its silent power over the conscience into a secular sword. For us to have assembled here as Protestant Christians, the hierarchy had to have poured out all its atrocities upon the human species in a Gregory and innocent, so that the rampant depravity of moral standards and the crying scandal of spiritual despotism could embolden an intrepid Augustinian monk to give the signal for the revolt and to snatch half of Europe away from the Roman hierarchy. For this to have happened, the weapons of our princes had to wrest a religious peace from Charles V. A Gustavus Adolphus had to have avenged the breach of this peace and establish a new universal peace for centuries. Cities in Italy and Germany had to have risen up to open their gates to industry, break the chains of serfdom, wrest the scepter out of the hands of ignorant tyrants, and gain respect for themselves through a militant Hanseatic League in order that trade and commerce should flourish and superfluity to have called forth the arts of joy so that the nation should have honored the useful husbandsmen and a long-standing happiness for mankind should have ripened into the beneficent middle class, the creator of our, our entire culture. Germany's emperor had to have debilitated themselves in centuries of battles with the popes, with their vassals, with jealous neighbors, Europe had to have unloaded its dangerous abundance in the graves of Asia, and the defiant feudal aristocracy had to have bled its indignant rebellious spirit to death in a murderous law of the fist, Roman campaigns and crusades, so that confused chaos could sort itself out and the contending powers of the state rest in a blessed equilibrium. And from thence is our present leisure, the reward. For our mind to have rested itself free of the ignorance in which spiritual and secular compulsion held it enchained, the long-suppressed germ of scholarship had to have burst forth again among its enraged persecutors, and an al mamun had to have paid the spoils to the sciences, which an Omar had extorted from them. The unbearable misery of barbarism had to have driven our ancestors forth from the bloody judgments of God and into human courts of law. Devastating plagues had to have called medicine run astray back to the study of nature. The idleness of the monks had to have prepared from a distance a substitute for the evil which their works had created. And profane industry in the monasteries had to have preserved the ruined remains of the Augustinian age until the time 
of the art of printing had arrived. The depressed spirit of the Nordic barbarian had to have uplifted itself to Greek and Roman models, and erudition had to have concluded an alliance with the muses and graces, should it ever find a way to the heart and deserve the name of sculptor of man. But had Greece given birth to a Thucydides, a Plato, an Aristotle, had Rome given birth to a Horace, a Cicero, a Virgil, and Livy, were these two nations not to have ascended to the heights of political wealth to which they indeed attained? In a word, if their entire history had not preceded them, how many inventions, discoveries, state and church revolutions had to conspire to lend growth and dissemination to these new still tender sprouts of science and art? How many wars had to be waged how many alliances concluded, sundered and become newly concluded to finally bring Europe to the principle of peace, which alone grants nations, as well as their citizens, to direct their attention to themselves and to join their energies to a reasonable purpose. Even in the most everyday activities of civil life, we cannot avoid becoming indebted to centuries past. The most diverse periods of mankind contribute to our culture in the same way as the most remote regions of the world contribute to our luxury. The clothes we wear, the spices in our food, and the price for which we buy them, many of our strongest medicines, and also many new tools of our destruction, do they not presuppose a Columbus who discovered America, a Vasco da Gama who circumnavigated the tip of Africa? There was thus a long chain of events pulling us from the present moment aloft toward the beginning of the human species, the which intertwine is cause and effect. Only the infinite understanding can survey these events wholly and completely. For man, narrower limitations are set. One, countless of these events have either found no human witness or observer, or they have been preserved by no science. Among these are all those which have preceded the human species itself and the invention of letters. The source of all history is tradition and the organ of tradition is speech. The entire epoch prior to speech, however momentous it may have been for the world, is lost to world history. Two, but after speech was invented, through it the possibility existed to express things which occurred and to communicate further so in the beginning, this reporting occurred over the insecure and changeable way of myths. From mouth to mouth, such an event was transmitted over a long succession of generations. And since it passed through media, which are changed and do change, it too necessarily suffered these changes. Living tradition, or the myth by word of mouth, is thus a highly unreliable source for history. All events prior to the use of the written word, therefore, are as good as lost to world history. Three, but the written word itself is not eternal either. Countless monuments of ancient ages have been destroyed by time and accidents, and only a few ruins have been preserved for the ancient world into the time of the art of printing. Most of them, by and large, are lost to world history, together with the information they should have provided us. Among the few monuments, finally, which time has spared, the larger number has been disfigured by passion, by lack of judgment, and often even by the genius of those who describe them but have been rendered unrecognizable. Our mistrust awakens at the oldest of historic monuments, and it does not leave us even at the chronicles of the present day. If we hear the testimonies of an event which happened only today and among people with whom we live and in the town we inhabit, and we have difficulty making the truth, out of their contradictory reports, what courage can we summon up for nations and times more distant from us on account of the strangeness of their customs than the distance and time of thousands of years? The small sum of events remaining after all these deductions have been made is the substance of history in its broadest understanding. Now, what? And how much of this substance of history belongs to universal history? Out of the entire sum of these events, 
the universal historian selects those which have had an essential, irrefutable, and easily ascertainable influence upon the contemporary form of the world and on the conditions of the generations now living. It is the relationship of an historical fact to the present constitution of the world, therefore, which must be seen in order to assemble material for world history. World history thus proceeds from a principle which is exactly contrary to the beginning of the world. The real succession of events descends from the origin of objects down to their most recent ordering. The universal historian ascends from the most recent world situation upwards toward the origin of things. When he ascends from the current year and century and thoughts to the next proceeding and takes notes of those among the events presented to him, containing the explanation for the succeeding years and centuries. When he has continued this process stepwise up to the beginning, not of the world, for to that place there is no guide, but to the beginning of the monuments, and then he decides to retrace his steps on the path thus prepared, and to descend unhindered and with light steps, with the guide of those noted facts from the beginning of the monuments down to the recent age. That is the world history we have and which will be presented to you. Because world history depends on the wealth and poverty of sources, there must arise as many gaps in, the world, in world history as there exist empty passages in rich in tradition. However uniformly, necessarily, and certainly the passages in the world develop out of each other, they will appear disconnected and accidentally connected to each other in history. Therefore, between the course of the world and the course of world history, a remarkable disparity is evident. One might compare the former with an uninterrupted, continually flowing stream, from which, however, only here and there will a wave be illumined in world history. Since it can also easily happen that the relationship of the distant world event to the circumstances of the present years appears to us sooner than its connection with events which preceded it or were contemporary, it is thus also unavoidable that the events which are most precisely connected with the most recent age, not infrequently, seem to be isolated in the age to which they originally belong. A fact of this kind, for example, would be the origins of Christianity, and particularly of Christian ethics. The Christian religion made such diverse contributions to the form of our present world that its appearance becomes the most important fact for world history. But neither in the time in which it appeared, nor in the population in which it arose, does there lie a satisfactory basis for explaining its appearance, because we lack the sources. As such, our world history would never become anything but an aggregation of fragments and would never deserve the name of science. But now, the philosophical understanding comes to its aid. And while it binds these fragments together with artificial connections, it elevates the aggregate to a system, to a reasonably connected whole. Its authority for this lies in the uniformity and invariant unity of the laws of nature and of the human soul, which unity is the reason that the events of most distant antiquity return in the most recent times under the coincidence of similar circumstances from the outside, and also the reason that, therefore, from events most recent, lying within the field of our observation, a conclusion can be drawn and some light shed in hindsight on events which faded away in prehistoric times. The methods of drawing conclusions by analogies is as powerful an aid in history as everywhere else, but it must be justified by an important purpose and must be exercised with as much circumspection as judgment. The philosophical mind cannot dwell on the material of world history long until a new impulse striving for harmony becomes active in him, one which irresistibly stimulates him to assimilate everything around him into his rational nature and to raise every phenomenon he sees to its highest recognizable effect, to thought. The more often and the more successfully he thus repeats this attempt to connect the past to the present, the more he is inspired to connect that as means and intent, which he sees to be interlocked as cause and effect. One phenomena after the other begins to shed blind caprice, lawless freedom, 
and to add itself as a well-fitting link and harmonious whole, which admittedly exists only in his imagination. Soon he finds it difficult to persuade himself that the succession of phenomena, which achieves so much regularity in the quality of being intended in his imagination, does not have these qualities in reality. He finds it difficult to surrender that to the blind rule of necessity, which had begun to take on such vivid form under the borrowed light of the understanding. He thus takes this harmony from out of himself and plants it outside of himself into the order of things. He brings a reasonable purpose into the course of world history and a theological principle into world history. With this principle, he wanders once more through world history and holds it up, testing again and testing it against each phenomena which this grand theater presents him. He sees it confirmed by a thousand concurring facts and disproved by just as many others. But as long as important links are missing in the course of changes in the world, as long as destiny withholds the final explanation about so many events, he declares this question to be undecided. And that opinion will triumph, which is able to offer the greater satisfaction to the mind and to the heart, the greater bliss. There is probably no need to recall that a world history according to the latter plan can be expected only in most recent times. A precipitous application of this grand standard could easily lead the historian to the temptation to do violence to events and to thus move more and more away from this bright epoch of world history in the desire to accelerate it but attention cannot be called too early to this illuminated and yet so neglected side of history that through which it attaches itself to the highest object of all human endeavors. Already, the cursory glance in this regard, even if the goal is merely possible, must lend the diligence of the researcher an invigorating incentive and sweet recreation. Even the smallest of efforts will be important for him when he sees himself on the way or when he guides his successor on the way towards solving the problem of the ordering of the world and to meet the supreme mind in his most beautiful effect. And treated this way, gentlemen, the study of world history will give you an attractive as well as useful occupation. It will enkindle light in your mind and a charitable enthusiasm in your heart. It will cure your mind of the common and narrow view of moral matters. And while it displays the grand picture of the times and nations before your eyes, it will improve upon the rash decisions of the moment and the limited judgments of egoism. While it accustoms a person to connect himself with the entirety of what is past and to rush on with his conclusions into the far future, so it veils the boundary between birth and death, which circumscribes human life so narrowly and so oppressively and it thus extends his brief existence by optical illusion into an infinite space and unnoticed leads the individual over into the species. Man changes himself and flees the stage. His opinions change and flee with him. History alone remains incessantly on the scene, an immortal citizen of all nations and all times. Like the Homeric Zeus, it looks with an equally bright view down upon the bloody work of war and upon peaceful nations, which innocently feed themselves from the milk of their herds. However lawlessly the freedom of man may seem to deal with the contest, it calmly gazes upon the confused, the confused play for its far-reaching view already discovered in the distant future, the way where this lawlessly roaming freedom will be guided by the reins of necessity. What history keeps secret from the reproachful conscience of a Gregory and a Cromwell, it rushes to proclaim to mankind. The egoistic man may indeed pursue baser ends, but he unconsciously promotes splendid ones. No false gleam will blind history. No prejudice of the times will seduce it because it experiences the final destiny of all things. In the eyes of history, Everything is injured in equally long time. It holds the rewarded olive garland fresh and destroys the obelisk erected by vanity. 
by dissecting the fine mechanism by which the silent hand of nature methodically developed the powers of mankind from the very beginning of the world. And while it precisely indicates in each period of time what has been achieved on behalf of this great plan of nature, at the same time it restores the true standard of happiness in merit which prevailing delusion distorted in a different way in every century. History cures us of exaggerated admiration for antiquity and childish longing for the past. And while it draws our attention to our own possession, it does not let us wish back the praised golden ages of Alexander and Augustus. All preceding ages, without knowing it or aiming at it, have striven to bring about our human century. Ours are all the treasures which diligence and, re and genius, reason and experience have finally brought home in the long age of the world. Only from this history will you learn to set a value on the goods for which habit and unchallenged possession so easily deprive our gratitude. Priceless, precious goods upon which the blood of the best and the most noble clings. Goods which had to be won by the hard work of so many generations. And who among you, in whom a bright spirit is conjugated with a feeling heart, could bear this high obligation in mind without a silent wish being aroused in him to pay that debt to coming generations, which he can no longer discharge to those past. A noble desire must glow in us to also make a contribution out of our means to this rich bequest of truth, morality, and freedom, which we receive from the world past and which we must surrender once more, richly enlarged to the world to come. And in this eternal chain, which winds itself through all human generations to make firm our ephemeral existence. However different the destinies may be, which await you in society, all of you can contribute something to this. A path toward immortality has been opened up to every achievement, to the true immortality, I mean, where the deed lives and rushes onward. And if the name of the author should remain even, even if the name of the author should remain behind. Perfect. Yeah, I just found that this is just such a condensed encapsulation of all of the right ideas that if they're worked upon become healthy instincts for anybody really pursuing truth and doing it for the right reasons, right? Because we are living in history ourselves. And he knows that. So I, I love how he's talking subjectively to his audience in this, in this way to try to bring out the best in these students who are like in their, their teens, their 20s, and trying to make sense of the type of identities they're going to take on for themselves as they go on into the world. And, uh, and he's also talking to future generations as well, right? So he's having this dialogue with the past, his present, and the future that is all he doesn't dichotomize them, you know, in, in past, present, future. They're all part of the same uh, continuity. So it's really, what do you guys, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts or ideas or questions or anything of what we've, we've read a lot. I mean, he said a lot of different things. The, the germ of the universal history stuff came, like, I mean, I think a bit after the second half. Um, I, I, I was just, I had a visual at least in my head of like, you know, cause he's talking about all these different parts, you know, so I, there's like a puzzle and then he's saying, but all these pieces of the puzzle are actually missing. Most of a good deal of them are missing. Um, but then he's saying, but if we understand through our reason that necessarily, you know, everything that came before everything leading up to this moment, you know, all these necessarily all the things that happened before had to happen like there's an interconnectedness i mean it's it's leibnizian right he even mentions leibniz like there's a dynamic uh, if you would know one if you would know everything about one single thing in the universe you would necessarily know everything about the universe and so schiller makes this point about events in history um there even if you take away a lot of the pieces you know that they're necessarily connected to everything else so if you kind of go back or forward, there's a necessary uh, thread that has to go through them. Even if those pieces aren't there, 
there's a certain thread that you can still, uh, by necessity, that should be there. So he, I feel like he's talking about how do you go about unearthing that thread, which is, is there by necessity, even if all the pieces yeah. are not right before you. Yeah, absolutely. In that sense, I, I like how he started by getting across to the students that there's this danger of fraud and deception that they're going to walk into right on, right, right on page 254 here. So he's, go, he's going at it from the standpoint that there is this corruption that's going to try to seduce each one of you, but is also embedded there in history to, to create fraud and deception for those seeking truth. And there's like false models, there's false theories set in your path that break the continuity, that create distortions, disharmonies in the structure of your soul, of your idea of what history is, you know? And this is where the subjective element comes in because if you yourself are, are have a strong relationship to your soul and a good sense of truth and beauty and goodness, then you could cut through the misinformation and piece together even missing information that you know must exist to explain why certain events happened the way that they happened. It's like people say yeah, to me, you know, like, there's common, there, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to use one quick example then, Cynthia. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I was just thinking quickly as a concrete example of that. Like people will often say, they have that this- was Dave, by the way. Oh, Dave, I thought, sorry. You confused my voice for Dave's. <laughs> Oops, I'm going to pay for that. Um, yeah, like there's a, a popular model um, of like the American Revolution, which is really big. That's that posits that um, to explain it away that it's just a you know a bunch of people who didn't want to pay taxes that caused them to like risk their lives and create a, a new type of society that never existed before. And it's just that they didn't want to pay taxes. And it's just brushed, brushed off. All the other evidence is just blood. And it's like, okay, well, would people really, really give, like risk their lives and families and fortune and everything in order to like establish a Republic founded on these, these principles of, and these inalienable rights. If it was just to like, they were greedy and they didn't want to pay taxes or they, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't explain that properly. There has to be something else. And so, yeah, I think just a lot of people, they, they, themselves are greedy, you know, they themselves are conditioned by uh, the system that has brought out greedy habits and passions. So they, they look at the past through the filter sort of of their own biases, their own, and they're like, yeah, that, that, that I can identify with that. I, I can't identify with somebody who would die for a cause, you know, <laughs> like, so I, that doesn't mean any, does, doesn't make any sense to me, but I can, I'm motivated by money as well. So yeah, that makes sense. And they just accept it and it, and it just passes on as gossip that becomes a fact. So, right. Yeah. There, there's a modern word for that. And I mean, I think it's a, it's a useful word. And in a sense, Schiller starts this whole thing. They, they say grifter, right? You're a grifter, you're a careerist. You know, you're just looking to get ahead. And Schiller actually starts his whole essay by calling out the grifters and careerists. I mean, that's, that's pretty significant. So he obviously saw that, that was, it's necessary to call these people out. And it's true, right? They're just, they're anything immoral and just sort of career orientated. They're not really people, you know, in the, they're not striving for, for very human goals. It's more survival, mm -hmm. right? I, I think uh, Juan said it uh, in French there. He said something about the boomers and the défense à soupe. <laughs> they're yeah, the défense à soupe. soupe. You know, they need to hold up these narratives because at a certain level, like their comfort and, and livelihood is dependent on that system. And that's just, it's very, it's very gross. Mm -hmm. yep. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know that um, we had read uh, this concept that everything had to happen from uh, one of Leibniz's works. I forgot the specific name of it. Do you remember, Matt? Dis was it Discourse on Metaphysics? No, I don't think so. There's a lot in Discourse Metaphysics that's pretty comprehensive. So maybe, um, well, what, what exactly is your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that uh, everything Everything's connected. Every 
yes, <laughs> uh, that everything had to happen. But I find that I have problems with that because, um, <clears throat> again, we have the choice of the free will. And also there is such a thing as tragedy. And there is such a thing as, you know, much of the point of like what Schiller focuses on or um, any good dramatist um, is how to avoid tragedy, right? To recognize um, elements of a tragic situation um, that you can learn from so that you, could, you can prevent it within your own time, which everybody faces these elements on one level or another during their time. So our, you know, our role, the more we have an understanding of such things, of where things, in what direction things should be going in, is to avert from tra tragedy as much as possible. So, um, you know, with this, of just shaping things with like, it just had to happen that way. I find that it's like, okay, so the tragedies that were, that actually successfully occurred, those had to happen, but the tragedies that were averted, that had to happen, you know? Like, I feel that it's, it's not, um, it's, not a, a, it's not a fully developed way of, of, of thinking about it. Like, do these things really have to happen? Uh, I would like to answer to that question, okay? Because uh, I, I was going to say that uh, page 167 to uh, 67 to page 209, uh, Schiller gave uh, the core of his answer, what is universal history? And uh, at page 167, uh, it's written that uh, the universal historian, when uh, try to go up and to go to the sources of things, okay? Uh, when Leibniz said that a tragedy is bound to happen anyway in a certain situation, uh, it's because uh, the, uh, how can I say it, the ratio of unawareness on awareness is at a certain amount, okay? And you cannot force the level of collective awareness um, in a brutal manner because uh, uh, there's, a, there's a march to a sovereign mind in the case of a person. There's also, also a march to a collective civilization, which is called universal history, okay? Uh, I think that all of you here make very easily the um, the parallel between the march to a sovereign mind for a person and the march to a uh, lasting civilization for the collectivity. And I think that the word that answer very precisely to that uh, concept by Leibniz, which is not the fatalism, okay? Uh, because when Leibniz says that what is bound to happen is bound to happen, it's not fatalism. I think it's realism. Because the, the, the Greek word, one of my favorite words that I want to introduce that you already know because I presented on that in the past, is kairos. Okay, kairos. Uh, because precisely kairos is the channel connecting tampus the source of truth, goodness, and beauty to Kronos, which is the history in space time. So when an event or many events are happening, you have a cross, okay? But Kairos is not the crisis. The crisis is only the, the trigger of a possible Kairos, okay? And the kairos is precisely, and that would be the answer to how to always maintain the progression of universal history, always in the good direction, okay? Because how would you be capable to make uh, truth, goodness, and beauty erupt in space-time? Meaning that in political action, it would be people would be capable to have uh, uh, valor, wisdom, 
humanity and justice in that crisis, okay? Because kai kairos is not the crisis. Crisis is a triggering event or situation that would, that maybe would provoke a kairos, okay? A junction between tampos, the source of truth, goodness, and beauty, and that specific space-time where the event or the situation is happening, okay? That I take a very obvious example. What is happening in Ukraine now, okay? Is a possible situation for Kairos to appear. If uh, a ruler or many rulers, uh, with their advisors, of course, are capable to provoke a heightened collective awareness in order to make appear truth, goodness, and beauty in space-time, which will be translated as actions guided by wisdom, va valor, justice, and humanity. What, uh, what uh, Schiller wrote as the universal, page 167, uh, that the universal historian um, okay, the universal historian ascends from the most recent world situation, for example, what is happening in Ukraine, upwards toward the origin of things, okay? So uh, it's, um, at, uh, it's, okay, you have the f first three lines, after you have a big paragraph, and what I just read is the maybe uh, world history thus proceeds from a principle which is exactly contrary to the beginning of the world, okay? And the real succession of events descends from the origin of objects down to their most recent ordering. The universal historian ascends from the most recent world, the situation, upwards toward or the origin of things. So here in the paragraph, he makes the distinction, the beginning of the world, which is the chronology, chronos, and three lines later, he would, he would speak about the origin and upwards. So the beginning of the world is the beginning of a cycle of chronos, uh, we can take, for example, for the situation in Ukraine, you can say, for example, I to take the Orange Revolution in 2003 as uh, the beginning of that situation, or you can go even before. But when, he's, when he wrote, uh, the universal history historian ascends from the most recent world situation upwards, okay? And not in the past, upwards toward the origin of things, it's precisely Kairos concept, even if I'm very disappointed he did not use the word Kairos, because I'm absolutely sure that he knew the word Kairos, okay? <laughs> because of the classical education that they had in the past, it's impossible that he didn't know the word Kairos. Um, so, and that precisely, the, the duty of advanced rulers to provoke by their speeches, by their action, by their uh, dialogue with their people and with their advisor and with their opponents and enemies, of course, to make that eruption of truth, goodness, and beauty. And that's what she meant upwards toward the origin of things, mm -hmm. contrary to three or four lines before the beginning of the world, which would be a chronological analysis of the situation, which can be useful, but it's not the same than to make appear valor, wisdom, justice, and humanity. Mm. And if the rulers or the rulers with an S and the advisors with an S are incapable to do that, Kairos eruption, uh, maybe for their clan, maybe you don't know the word Kairos, it's written K-A-I-R-O-S. And uh, well, 
uh, it's what uh, we go back to what Leibniz said. It's bound. To, it wouldn't. It wouldn't happen. Okay. What is bound to happen will happen if there's not enough truth, goodness, and beauty translated in human actions, guided by just value, wisdom, and right. humanity. Right. Plus, could we say that we can't really fail because if we were to fail as a as humankind, then we wouldn't have been created in the first place. Yes. Well, mm-hmm. I'm rather optimistic. Okay, because first, I, I okay, maybe I should not say that because it's recorded. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I like very much Putin, and I think that he he made a very he decided something very difficult, okay? He crossed the Rubicon and he was perfectly aware of it, but for different complex reason. And he, 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 he made many speeches uh, during the last two weeks uh, to the world, to the Russians, uh, to the Europeans, and so on. He's trying to provoke a Kairos, okay? I don't know if he will succeed. Mm. I think that he has the... He has the uh, the intellectual power and the spiritual power to succeed. I think so. I cannot guarantee his success, but mm-hmm. everything he's done now is to provoke a kairos. Mm-hmm. And I, I've got a uh, that's a great point. And I think yeah, like people who think on that higher level um, are sensitive to the fact that you can't force a kairos, just like you cannot force. Um, the integration of will, freedom, and, and duty. Like you can't force knowledge, right? It's, you can just create situations that can be more conducive to the invocation of a kairos uh, or greater density of discoveries. And I was just reminded of this uh, statement by the mother of uh, John Quincy Adams writing in 1779. And I was just looking at this, at this today because I'm writing an article that involves J- John Quincy Adams, right? And so this woman who's a phenomenal person. She even had like John Quincy, uh, like translating Plato's Theatetus dialogues, uh, dialogue into English. And he was also uh, one of the first American translators of Schiller. And she writes, and I quote, this is 1777, right? So the American revolution is, is, is raging. These are the times in which a genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed, great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which would otherwise lie dormant wake into life and form form the character of the hero and the statesman. She was really in tune with that, I think. but I think today Absolutely. Well, right? another, Absolutely. another situation of such great potential and great danger, um, characteristics that would otherwise be dormant in a whole bunch of people have now a chance to really blossom. So I think, yeah, it can only happen if, if, if it's, if the, yeah, if, like what Putin is doing is really forcing now reality action to finally take, take a place in history instead of just being like a game of lies and subterfuge where everyone's pretending that there's like, you know, <laughs> That, that, that this war has not already begun years ago? He's like, no, it's... Of course. Oh, yeah. and, and, and that's what uh, when, and that's what uh, Schiller uh, meant by, uh, to the big, uh, uh, to, 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 to the beginning of the world, okay? the chronological analysis, but uh, to, me, to, 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 to create a solution uh, it's not the chronological analysis or the blaming game, okay? Because everyone uh, is responsible, okay? Uh, I, even if I said that I put in, I don't think that he's perfectly white and with no uh, responsibility. Uh, I think in that kind of things, everyone is, is responsible to a certain extent. Uh, uh, even if I have my preferences, of course, I, uh, and I'm not perfectly uh, objective either. But uh, the most important thing is not the chronological analysis, the blaming game. The most important thing is precisely to provoke that Kairos uh, event that would uplift uh, the collective awareness and that from uplifting that we would get the solution.
-hmm. And I think it will succeed to a certain extent, but that's my personal preference. I cannot predict the future. Cynthia, I mean, the, the question you posed, though, is so valuable. It's really, really an important one. And it's, it's not evident. But yeah, it's, it's like, if you, it's like when you look at the, the question and you end from one vantage point, it appears that that it's absolutely not true that everything that happened had to happen. Because obviously, people didn't have to be fools, didn't, they didn't have to waste their time. And, and, and you know, pe evil, evil people didn't have to be evil. So of course it could have been otherwise, but then if, if you look at it from the other vantage point that um, if people were at the stage of, of uh, underdevelopment, of lack of, of unifying their, their, their duty and their, their desires where they were, right? And they, they made their decisions the way they did because we have free will uh, based on their, their degrees of ignorance and, and folly, then yeah, it kind of did have to play out the way it did. Um, but then why is it the best of all possible worlds? Like, why is that true? Is still uh, a fun challenge to work through psychologically, right? Like, because that it, it, it only, it's only uh, like when that falls on us individually, right? That, that we could start answering that. Because it's like, yeah, it could have been a lot better than it is. So why is it being all messed up as, as we find our world? How is it this still the best of all possible universes that we live in that God created, you know? Uh, uh, Matthew, the, the key word here is possible, okay? Uh, because uh, once again, a, a certain configu configuration of the universe is the direct result of the ratio between awareness and unawareness. Mm. And if at the cycle of universe, you have a certain ratio, that ratio when created that possible world. Mm -hmm. And the only way to, to have another possibility is to move the, the, the entity that is movable because uh, the space particles are not movable. They, are, they don't have consciousness. Uh, but uh, uh, the only way to have another possibility or many other possibilities is to move the thing that is movable, which is the level of collective awareness. Well, I need its own TV show. <laughs> No, oh, uh, Roger Thai Foundation is quite good. To <laughs> no, this is, yeah, this is, you, you are reminding us of things that we in some way already know, but um, it's, it's easy to be frustrated and, uh, and pessimistic, like, especially with what all of Europe is, is acting like right now. It's, uh, well, I, I have uh, every week a conversation with a friend. And he's rather the, uh, he believes very much in mechanical uh, reaction. And I, 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 he called me the moralist because I always talk about awareness. Uh, if you don't bring in action the, aware, the, awareness, the awareness factor or uh, moving upwards, you will always have the same thing, okay? And uh, there's no need to complain or to cry afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because it's our fault. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, very well said. Should uh, we close with a Schiller poem? <laughs> I have a nice one. Which one are you proposing? Uh, Fecla. Very, very, very beautiful piece. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if we're done though. I was just throwing that out. I, I think. Um, yeah. It's what is it? It's nine forty. Uh, uh, yeah. I guess so. I, does anybody have any closing thoughts or questions uh, that they want to throw out there before we uh, we round it out with the poem? I thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, you uh, um, the uh, and the stuff about the students of bread. And uh, how how do they work versus the uh, the students of philosophy? Yeah, and and the whole idea of uh, of um, the the students the the philosophical students seeking for uh, for 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 beauty reminded me of like Plato's Symposium and his uh, um, begetting in beauty. 
Absolutely. And it, as an ascent beauty itself. Oh, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Which based on what was just said as well about the Kairos, Kronos, universal and, and specific temporal, um, that's, that was sort of also the master key in Socrates' um, oration, right? If I, if I recall regarding love and how I, each person took their term hypothesizing what love is with their own poetic form. And yeah. in Plato's case, or Socrates, he resolved it by getting at the fact that it's actually the effect of a yearning for immortality that mm -hmm. causes what we empirically see with mothers and even in, in lower forms of life willing to die to preserve their young and suffer yeah. because there's a yearning of the soul to be more than temporal and to be universal and divine and it, it expressed itself that way and that's yeah. what true love should be so it's very the, beautiful the kairos chronos thing but yeah that's uh, good there you go the bread scholar that's uh Shame on he who chooses to live a life with a bread scholar. Shame. And it's yeah, like I... he's talking, you know, our problems today with peer-reviewed studies in the scientific priesthood uh, that we're, you know, that's, that's destroying so much of the world today and destroying so much creativity. It's like, it, it's, it's refreshing to see Schiller talking the way he does because it shows you it's not really just a modern problem. This has been going on for a long time, right? those who just get so attached to their models that they, they see instinctively creativity and new thoughts that challenge their models as being a, a danger that must be destroyed and they have to iron it out. <laughs> and so you, you know, you get this real anti-creative form of science, which is the, the opposite of what science actually is taking a hold in a, in a new priesthood, um, a secular sort of pagan, <laughs> whatever it is. And the more evil uh, part to that, because, you know, Schiller didn't go there, but I, I know he definitely was aware of it, is that these kind of gatekeepers for their own, you know, models and their own rigid understanding of their sciences, they're ultimately protecting something that was created oftentimes uh, to control people. Um, you know, again, we've mentioned Darwinism a lot in, in both of our writings that, you know, Darwinism was very clearly to attack an understanding of the universe as being purposeful, having a direction, rather it was now uh, supposed to be random, everything was by chance, and that humans were, you know, uh, no different from apes. Um, and people were uh, eventually ridiculed for not believing in such a thing. And these people who made their life's work around Darwinism, um, you know, protect it because they're bread fed scholars, but they're al also protecting um, a narrative that is meant to keep people, uh, you know, sort of shackled. Their, their minds are also not free to, to create because it would uh, threaten that system of um, oppression that is occurring. So there's that other level to it that a lot of these scholars are most often not aware of, but these universities today, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to avoid um, having to pay lip service to, to these, um, these narratives, which really have no place in um in a form of government that actually is for the welfare of the people yeah by the way just kudos to these students who took all these notes it's just the i wish i could take notes like this <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking that same thing yeah people thought differently they, they had a different relationship to their memory I don't yeah, know, maybe, maybe Schiller, like, maybe Schiller edited the notes or something. Maybe they, they gave it to him and was like, and we're at, maybe asked him to like clean it up for them or something. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but in the past, uh, the the teacher uh, students re relations was very personal. Yeah, I'm quite sure that they had uh, meetings, uh, maybe with uh, twenty people afterwards, and I'm I'm sure that uh, the notes that we have now is from one or two of those 20s and not the 300s uh, yeah. in, the, in the big hall, so. 
Mm -hmm. And that tradition uh, still exists, uh, even if uh, it doesn't produce uh, many. Uh, how can I, even if it doesn't seem to produce uh, truth and goodness and beauty, but uh, in the universities of the Anglo Sierra, the tradition to go to to either to the house of the teacher or some private place uh, with 10, 15 students. Uh, to discuss in, on a deeper level, uh, I think it still exists, but uh, it doesn't seem to give uh, great results uh, <laughs> during the last two, two, three generations. Well, if you uh, if you go to discuss privately with Liu Strauss, uh, <laughs> it might not give uh, sublime things. Uh. <laughs> or William Yandel Elliot or Albert Volstetter. Yeah. yeah. It depends with whom you go to discuss privately. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, it just, cause I know that's something Declan, you're, you're also thinking a lot about too, right? Like you're getting uh, ready to go into university or you're already in university, is it? Or No, I'm thinking about it though. Thinking about it. Right. Yeah. So you're looking at different ways to maintain your soul and grow while at the same time being in the system. And that's always challenging. I don't, I don't, it's, it's a lot of work, eh? Um, to really, cause you have to do more work than is expected of you in some ways. And I don't know how one excels within that type of structure where yet you, you're almost, I guess, it depends what you're doing, where you're, you're, uh, you know, you, you kind of are expected to put your mind in a certain unnatural mode in order to make it through um, the hoops, um, it's doable. It must be. <laughs> but, Quan, Quan did it. Quan did it. That's true. Yeah. Quan did do it. What was your secret, yeah. Quan? Well, uh, I was in medical school. It's a rather technical school, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I got my philosophical uh, preparation by, by my family. And so... So oh, I, I noticed that uh, when I went to medical school more, more than 30 years ago, uh, I, I noticed a certain uh, decadence in terms of spirituality, morality, but it has been given by my family. So I just uh, received the technical part to get the paper. Uh, and for the technical part, it's, it's good. It's not bad. It's not the degenerate to that extent. So I would say that uh, maybe a, a, a a practical advice to Declan. Medical school is not too degenerate. Uh, some engineering schools are still quite good because you know those schools are the technical stuff. Eh? So you cannot have bad doctors, bad engineers. Uh, so uh, they are not too rotten yet. Mm -hmm. At least in my time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm going on. I'm not no, no gender studies. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Exactly. You know, you know, even the decadent society need good engineers, good architects, good doctors, so they cannot uh, afford to destroy those schools. Unless they want to commit suicide, I'm not sure if we at that stage yet. Hmm. What about things like uh, like trade trade schools and stuff? I mean, because I oh I, those are completely degenerate because they now Declan would be uh, completely uh, brainwashed with the modern monetary uh, theory or things like that. Oh no no which, I meant sort of like I, oh. I meant trade like you know where you just go in you learn a trade electrician plumbers like, and stuff yeah to be like you know oh yeah to learn a technical of course, like hands on practical training but not a lot of theory it's just like. Oh straight basic okay. stuff how about uh, okay for, for yeah no th those are good those are good because uh, everything that is very practical okay uh which is not subjected to bullshit uh, uh you cannot uh, make it uh, completely degenerate okay uh the the, the lamp is working or is not working the refrigerator is working or not working okay you cannot you cannot bullshit those things <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, you find it working or not? Uh, the air conditioning is working or not? You can, you know, it's yes or no. Okay, there's no middle term. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, those those sometimes seem really uh, really good looking because it yeah. also keeps you in the same place as well. No no moving around. Yeah. Hmm. What do you mean? What do you mean by keeps you in the same place? You mean like? Well, like uh, I can get a job where where I'm living right now versus like uh, um, like off in Timbuktu. Oh, I see. Like, yeah, right. If you're, uh, yeah, in academia, you get a job as a faculty member at a university, you have to travel there or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, also too, like, it doesn't matter where uh, you have to replace, like, an elect like if you're working on a, on a, on a power station, the, the principles in a, a power station, whether it's a hydroelectric dam in Quebec or in Vermont or in Africa, it's like, it's the same uh, ultimately the same thing you're working on. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can have, you can translate that if you did choose to, to move around, you have that. There option. seems to be more money too being put into the space program. I don't know now under Biden what's going on with that, but I know that they Biden. feel they need to compete with uh, China, right. And increasingly, mm -hmm. uh, Russia and India. So, um, there might well, be also a future in that. He succeeded to put China and Russia together in the space station. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not very nice for me to say that, but I should send, send him a letter of, of, of thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mr. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think the Russians are so angry now that they simply uh, refuse to send uh, no, but Elon must buy, must be happy because he wouldn't get the monopoly for sending U.S. Uh, satellites and so on. Has he done anything must be, uh, successful? Uh, though? Yeah, he's yeah. done a couple of successful. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, he, he's a he's a capable man. So we will start I'm a new conspiracy the theory. <laughs> we will start a new conspiracy theory. Everything is because of Elon Musk. <laughs> he is. Uh, conspiracy fact he's the biggest contractor for the pentagon private yeah, contractor yeah hey why did he lose a bunch of money recently i heard that his shares like plummeted oh don't worry for him don't worry <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you hear him he says some really really cool things and uh, re really interesting things he really agree with and then he goes off and he does something really weird and you're like wait <laughs> Come on. I feel sorry for his kid. <laughs> How do you pronounce his kid's name? This kid's going to have issues. 02.4LW or something? or Come on. Seriously? No, seriously, I, I kid you not. Oh, yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah his, his kid's name is something like that. It's like a bunch of random letters and numbers. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's something missing there. There's, there's, there's yeah. Something anyway, elements around the space program are cool. And like, you know, I think China will eventually open up, you know, for foreigners to start working with them, you know, at a certain point. Oh. You're, you're young enough that you, you can you can hope to eventually get on board programs like that. Because, uh, yeah, China, China is doing so many optimistic things that, you know, even if you go to school in the U.S. as an engineer, you can have a future anywhere in the world, unless you don't want to move from where you're living, which might make it diff more difficult, but you can have all types of ambitious projects, you know. Well, Declan lives in, in Texas, which is, I mean, an aerospace center, right? So there's a lot of... A lot right, of you can probably work things. from Texas on, on those types of uh, projects. Yeah. Well, let's not forget that Elon Musk is there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Austin. Yeah. Because yeah. That, guy, that guy is capable, technically. Uh, I'm surprised with that thing concerning his children, but uh, <laughs> uh, well, since Declan is not his son, uh, no problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, he also is involved in a lot of the, the what is it, the metaverse stuff, he, yeah. or the uh, transhumanism stuff. Oh yeah, he's a big transhumanist. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I think that there's it's one of those things where the way I see it, it's sort of like the. Um, uh, there's an idea that, that I, I heard somebody call the Churchill reflex, which um, it just was a reference to how under Winston Churchill, when the British Empire realized that they could no longer control their Nazi Frankenstein monster and, and had to ultimately uh, put it down, 
um, or else their own existence was kind of the Hitler encounter. was never killed. What are you talking about? Oh, but I meant the the monster as as the broader. Oh, movie, okay. Not necessarily the guy who died in Argentina in the sixties. No, um, <laughs> that's a whole thing. But um, what at that point there was a need to unleash within the British Commonwealth countries of Australia and, and Canada, especially they needed to unleash a certain amount of creative power. Um, in order just to have the, the necessary productivity and ingenuity to put down, the, to execute the war, um, which was going to annihilate them. So I think with, they, but they needed to sort of control it so that it's a danger whenever the, whenever the empire allows for the flourishing, the blossoming of creativity, that like they, they take off the, the chains, right, just to preserve themselves. It's a bit dangerous because there's no guarantee they could get the chains back on again. They're kind of gambling on the fact that they'll be able to subvert it afterwards, which has ended. It took them a good, you know, in, in the case of Canada, a good 20 years to start putting that genie back in the bottle. Um, but still, it, it might have just, you know, gone total full Promethean as well. It could have, they could have, it could have gone that way. And I think with the case of China and Russia, they're just establishing such an excellence in, in technological and scientific um, outcomes that it's sort of forcing the empire to have these different zones of potential channeling of creative bursts that might be needed to compete on some level since mediocrity is so prevalent here right like everything in the west is pure mediocre like there's no way that that could withstand a combat with a, a competent matured eurasian uh type of struck you know system it can't work so i think the elon musk process is an attempt to try to create an environment where you will allow for a certain controlled creativity that they are hoping could be then, you know, uh, at, at some point when it's, when it's, a, you know, they think appropriate, you can cut the, cut the legs off of it again, but maybe, you yeah. know, but it's still there. It's still creativity. It's still good as far as it is creativity. It's, it's not a bad thing, you know? Yeah. But he wouldn't have to invent a personal jet pack to run away from his bus if needed, you know, yes. <laughs> uh, like, like in Star Wars. Okay. Like, uh, Boba Fett or Django Fett, they have a jetpack so they can run away easily. And <laughs> yes. so, uh, b because uh, I, I believe in what you said, Matt, okay, uh, there will be a, a, a kind of a technical elite that will be allowed to do things uh, creatively, but with the, uh, uh, the parade of the pattern to the bus. Okay, so, and, um, uh, wow, that's, that's the technocratic elite, okay, because the technocratic elite is not only the administrators, it's only, it's also the doctors, the engineers, the pharmacists, the, the architects, uh, all the people, all the people needed to do practical things. Uh, they, they cannot get, get rid of all those people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a, a double-edged sword. I think it's also, I mean, this is part of the problem with compartmentalization, right? The engineers are just thinking about engineering, but, you know, do they have uh, a sense of the, the bigger picture in which they're operating? Same for the doctors, right? Do they have a bigger sense of, like, the medical system and how it's operating? And, I mean, yes. it yes. seems like there's more crossover now because things are getting so wild. So a lot of people that were just not, turned on or are suddenly coming online and they're like whoa maybe i should know about this stuff which in a sense is the confusion is is in some sense good right because people are a bit disorientated but it's forcing them to break profile break character and kind of ask questions or wander down roads that they wouldn't necessarily wander so in that sense there's a lot of openness and i think that's that's part of it, right? Like engineers should be able to think in terms of the future of mankind, uh, not just, you know, how the circuit works. Uh, same with doctors, yeah. same, with, same with all these technical uh, things. And yeah, I think that that's a big issue, right? So if, they're, if that compartmentalization is broken and people can have a sense of vision, right? They, they get a sense that, okay, we, we, there does need to be a vision then people start to, to change the way they think about uh, what they're doing. Mm. 
Well, David, why do you think that they trashed philosophy and art two generations ago? Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> they want those. Uh, because they want those technical experts now. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that gets at what Schiller was saying in this in this text we just read that the the true philosophical spirit versus the bread fed scholar is always looking for what, how, how do you synthesize and bring back together the seemingly different branches of knowledge to their root, right? And he's like, and I say, and he said, I, I say bring back together because they were never truly separated. It, that, that's an mm -hmm. artificial abstraction, right, of human, humankind. But in fact, these are all just biologies, just one aspect of physics, which is one aspect of engineering, which is one aspect of medicine. It, they're, and it's only when your mind is focused on finding that, that harmony of all the parts, and you can stand in the center of your field and look out and see how it's connected with everything else, that you're in the right attitude, the right frame of mind. And so you might deal with the same material as, as your, your colleague who's a bread fed scholar, and you'll just do something totally different with it. You'll have a different relationship to it. And uh, there might be parallels in your behavior with that person doing a job, but it's totally a different universe that's that's going on inside right and how you what you're able to create is going to be very different from that other person who's just stiff like kind of like a machine just going through repetitive motion feeling enraged when something <laughs> new and challenging enters the scene all they can do is regurgitate yeah use their memory yeah. but not their mind proposed theory mm. yeah I, I have a proposed theory hypothesis working hypothesis because uh, there's the in, in a sense history is probably one of the more practical ways to breach that that higher discussion or that that, that broader discussion that leads to philosophy that leads to uh, you know the future in the sense that I remember it was uh, Dan Leach that was saying you know it, I think he said something like the only way that he ever uh, manages to get across or I, I forget the context but when he's talking to like boomers or very cynical type <laughs> uh, people is to hearken back to the time before JFK was killed and that like how things used to be because if you're just talking to people in the current situation and the way their identity is anchored to uh, recent times there's there's nothing there right they, they don't really budge it's just cynicism they're just quote unquote realists this is the way things are and it's that whole just selfish whatever take care of yourself your family friends but nobody's looking at the bigger picture and surprise, surprise, it just keeps getting worse. So it's, it's not working. But he just made the point that when you appeal to, like, before, you know, how were things, like, uh, in the past, and you, you speak to that identity, right, that it's, like, it's true. There was something else, and we've forgotten about that. I think this question of identity, and that's why history is important, because not everybody's going to go into the deep philosophical uh, chasms, but questions of, of basic identity, uh, tradition, and history have these things implied to a certain degree, right? Like what was America doing before Kennedy? They may not know the whole clash of two systems and the whole, you know, history of America, but at a, a visceral sense of identity, they they have a they have a sense of it. There's a living sense of that, and I think the more that is awakened in people it's it's actually one of the quicker routes to then just rousing an overall uh sense of, of motivation and uh future orientation and then you know the philo you know the the bigger ideas become easier to discuss but history well, and, and identity, drama too right dave like drama plays such a prominent role in the storytelling of history because like the example that we like to bring up often is that gibbons uh, wrote Roman history and how many thousands of pages and Shakespeare did it in like 60 or 70 pages a better job because it's not about the chronological order as Quan was emphasizing but that there is there is that crisis point and what are people going to do with that crisis point and that history is very much best taught universal history is drama um and there's a climax, there's a, there's a crisis point and there's mm. a resolution or there's tragedy. Um, and that's what's been severely uh, under attack in yeah. our world of not just mainstream narrative and you can't, 
you know, say anything counter to it, but there's a, there's an erasure of history now. And, uh, you know, libraries have literally dumped their books out on the street. That's one of the reasons yeah. why our library is so big. <laughs> it's because libraries, we took books from off the street that were being thrown out by libraries. And um, everything is being uh, digit digitized on the uh, internet. And, uh, you know, at any moment, these things can be just, you know, tweaked or lost. Um, that's been one of the fights over the centuries is always like when you want to destroy a culture, you destroy their centers of learning, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's something that people should be very concerned about here in the West. People already don't have a very good memory to begin with. They're not even going to notice that it went missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and that's yeah. one of the ways that you're able to get across, empower people's memory in a, in a, in a creative way is through storytelling too, right? Because when you... When you that's why they, the, the, the stars are configured in the form of these mythologies of gods and, and scorpions and, and, you know, like all of these imagery that. Um, right. That's what Dr. Rajvadam was saying, right? It's yeah, a metaphor exactly. for, for uh, yeah, teaching. Yeah, exactly. And then you can keep it in the mind when you have a story associated with Aquarius or whatever else. And then um, you can pass it on and, and the memory works better uh, versus trying to memorize like all of these sequential facts and data it's like you're, you have to do something unnatural with your mind to keep that type of knowledge in, in your head. You know, like I remember when I was in university, I was like cramming for, uh, for, some, for some tests, like uh, my criminal law test. I remember like having to cram and cram for like a week of memorization. And uh, I did really good on it, but uh, I don't remember anything. Like <laughs> it wasn't knowledge. I just like had it in there and then I was able to just like finally you know use it and then just forget it forever because it was never real knowledge the way they were teaching it so yeah storytelling in that sense when you really get what Shakespeare is doing or what Schiller is doing with his plays it stays the, the core lessons the causal nexus of the these history historical moments really mm -hmm. stick with you and then you also find yourself ironically remembering a lot more too your memory work you can remember names that normally you would never have stuck with you as long as they did, you know, because they have a, a characteristic, they have an identity, a purpose in something. They're not just names with no purpose. Right. That is the secret to Kwan's great memory. He yes. says, no, I remember no. what I read because I understand what I read. <laughs> yes, that's true. But uh, you have uh, some, uh, some tricks too. Okay. You, have, you, you, you can visualize the things, for example, the Greek, for example, they had a uh, memotechnic um, method that is quite good that I'm using, you will, if you have a, a subject, you will visualize a Greek temple and each mm -hmm. part of the Greek temple, which corresponds to the major uh, subtopics of your topic. For example, you visualize a temple with six columns and each of the, those six columns, which corresponds to the major subtopics. Yeah, that's so, the, that's the uh, strategy that Matteo Ricci used, right? Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, those, memory, because memory those palace. yes, because those guys knew their Greek and Latin classics. Mm. Yeah, the, the memory palace and, of Matteo Ricci. Yeah, that was it. Goes. Yeah, I have yeah, to work. Yeah. I have to work on that. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read some Osho Kwan, and I'm gonna work on you know the meditation techniques, and I'm gonna also look into how to work on this because. You have, like you have my blessings. You have my blessings. I'm tired of being a flopping fish, like gasping for air. I feel I was like, I just keep asking the same questions over and over again. I just need to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Be because, uh, because one of the most important thing that memorization has been very uh, looked down open in the modern time for the wrong reasons, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because you can memorize in a clever manner, meaning that you, you put memorization and understanding together. Yeah. Well, and, your type and, of memorization that you're getting at and what Matteo Ricci seems to be using is uh, based on imagination as well. Like you're, it's an active, it's not a passive trying to just put something on the, uh, the, the, the blackboard in your head, but it's you're not actually cramming. Creating... It's not cramming. Yeah. Yeah. You're not cramming it in. Yeah, exactly. You're creating, not cramming. I like that. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. You're creating a uh, metaphor. Every single thought that you're choosing to construct in the rooms, in the palace, the, the different or the, the it, it all yeah. is, a, is a creative thing that you then associate um, metaphorically. For example, why do, do, do we say that there are six stations of epistemological development? Because, <laughs> you know, there are six. OK, so if you have one, two, three, four and you don't remember the last two, well, you know, since there are six, two are missing okay i give a very down-to-earth example but it can be more complex of course mm -hmm. right Ooh, well, I um, uh, <laughs> uh, kevin what what was that was, kevin oh you can hear me now wow i can, I can, I can hear, hear you oh, okay um i was going to ask earlier, um, how can we access your library of Alexander? I tried to, to dig into it the other day and uh, couldn't seem to find it. It's at the bottom. When you go to our homepage, if you go to the very bottom of the homepage, there's a link. Okay. But I guess we Still should put that me. at the top of the page, Matt, if that's, um, if that's here, something. Here, check it out, check it out, check it out. There, there's a, sh a share screen here I just did. So, Kevin. If you could see the, the screen, um, I'm just going to go to the Rise and Tide Foundation site. And uh, so that's the Rise and Tide Foundation. And then we just scroll all the way to the bottom. Then you get the, um, the Digital Gallery of the Louvre, which we've never finished, unfortunately. We've got to do that at some point. And then you go to the Digital Library of Alexandria. It's right there. And then you can just scroll down. Right? And you got all the names. So We might want to put that at the top of our page, too, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's amazing that you guys put that together. I'm so happy for that. Yeah, there's still more work to be done, more entries to be made, but yeah, like everything we could find on Kuza is is all here, right? That's huge. Yeah, and then some supplementary reading as well, like classes by Will Wirtz on Kuza. Well, if uh, Quan also has suggestions for us to add to that library, um, that would be good too, because I think it's got a lot of Western stuff and not. <laughs> Well, Cyn Cyn Cynthia, <laughs> the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra by Osho, or AKA the Book of Secrets, <laughs> is there's one thing that the Indian civilization can give to the Westerners, is that book. Oh. Okay, because it's the opening to the higher level of awareness that I call four, five, six that can be, that can be uh, developed too by the Christian tradition because uh, you have equivalent in the Christian tradition uh, that are not uh, obvious for the average Christian, okay? And uh, meaning that uh, uh, unless you are interested in those things, uh, you would not learn that in the church. Uh, uh, I don't know if Declan uh, can uh, enlighten us on that subject. Oh, uh, what, what was that? What was the question? Uh, about uh, about uh, the um, the Christian equivalent uh, to the uh, meditative state, and uh, because um, uh, uh, it's about the mind, okay, the mind development or the journey of the soul. Um, in the Eastern tradition, it's it's. Um, it's obvious for the average Buddhist or the average Hindu, for example. But in the Christian tradition, according to my understanding, that tradition exists, but it would not be obvious for the average Christian. Maybe I'm mistaken. That's why I want you to enlighten us about that. Well, um, the, uh, uh, we, we Catholics really focus on liturgy as being very important and that uh, God had a purpose has a way he wants us to worship him and so there's so in like if you if you look at the especially the older um rites like the uh if you look at the eastern rite or look at the uh, extraordinary form which is all in latin or uh or a new a newer form called the ordinariate which is done in english and is reviving some of the uh stuff from that was some of the more beautiful prayers from the reformation it's all very ordered and there's specific things that you do and it's all very beautiful. And, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's focused on, on, on doing something that has, that has order to it. Even, even uh, aside from, from the mass, you have the liturgy of the hours, which the monks do, which um, was a, uh, a, certain, uh, a certain form of prayer that starts, you say certain times of the day, the morning, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, and evening, and then at night. And uh, there, there's, there's readings from the Bible, and there's, there's psalms, and there's songs, and, and it's, it's quite beautiful, and yeah. it's all about order. Yeah, I, be, I, be, yeah, I believe very much that everything that you just said is the equivalent to the meditation in the Buddhist tradition because by doing those things, it opens a space in the mind for the sacred or for the awareness precisely, okay? When, we, when I was talking of the Kairos uh, event, and uh, that is not the crisis, but rather the descent of truth, goodness, and beauty, enabling people to have actions uh, guided by justice, uh, humanity, valor, and wisdom. Uh, it's precisely those, those kind of things uh, that open the doors of that source of energy on a personal level. Mm -hmm. On an international level, I, I believe in the role of uh, of uh, of capable rulers i think the the idea of the uh, the focus on on always looking for the intersection of truth and goodness and beauty um regardless of of where we're coming from is always the key and and no matter whenever people are have their their souls tuned to that intention they will tend to uh find um a common a, like a commonality between themselves, right, and an ability to work together and transcend the the sort of tr the clash of civilizations garbage of the neoconservatives who try to get everybody into a framework where they're just thinking about us versus them, and ultimately, you know, in in in, in that matrix, there's no outcome for the the world civilizations and, and religions of the world but to end up clashing <laughs> with each other until the stronger destroys the weaker and comes out on top. And there's like, that's the only, it's like a real Darwinian outcome, right? The, the, the weaker will be destroyed by the, the, those who have the, are the strongest to survive. Very, very Darwinian. And, uh, and really a recipe for total disaster and unnatural. But yeah, when you, when, when you have otherwise, like you look at in, 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 uh, in uh, Syria, you've got Christians, Orthodox Christians, and you have Muslims all living in harmony together, you know, and you've got you know, these, these great, and in Iran too, it's like one of the biggest Jewish communities of the world outside of Israel. And they're living in Iran where most people, it's a challenge to a lot of people's prejudices who are living like in harmony with, with Muslims because there's a different attitude. They're, they're seeing each other as human beings made in the image of God for the most part. Um, so it works and they overcome the clash of civilizations and imperial paradox. But it's all about this unification of truth and goodness and beauty in that right way, I think. But um, isn't isn't truth inherently good? And so, so where does it not intersect? As well, I was wondering. Well, I, I think if you're if you're going by the definition of truth as it's taught in um, university today, it's not necessarily good. No, mm -hmm. it's like for those who say Darwinism is the truthful and only possible explanation for the mechanism that causes uh, life to evolve. If that's your mechanism. It's like, yeah, the consequence of that is like, you know, a lot of injustice and, you know, a lot of, a lot of weak being crushed by stronger. And it's just the way that the forces of nature work and it's truthful, but it's unfortunately necessary that, you know, the innocent are destroyed to satisfy <laughs> the, the, uh, the lusts of the, the, the stronger genetic stock who happen to be transhumanists or whatever, you know, and you apply it to social, <laughs> social theories. So yeah, then uh, so, but that's not really truthful. That's just somebody's yeah. imposition of the, the, the word truth. They're, they're abusing the word. And it's certainly yeah. not beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Or in like, a, I was in art school and uh, we were told that, you know, that which is beautiful is really that which makes the audience squirm. So when you can make people squirm uncomfortably, that's when you know you've attained like successful artwork. That was the, the philosophy of all of the teachers placed in university to teach uh, art 
And I knew that there was something wrong. I couldn't put my finger on it, but <laughs> it was definitely, it didn't feel right. Um, but you end up yeah. adapting to it. You know, people end up adapting to the ugliness who want to get the grades and they want to like be seen as, as uh, respectable and competent. And they end up like having to become fakers to find excuses why this abstract piece of crap art is actually really sophisticated and interesting. And you just end up becoming, you, you lose touch with your ability to judge right and wrong and, and anything. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that, I'm taking a, uh, 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 I'm, I'm doing a, a, at my church, we're putting on a play, Midsummer Night's Dream. And yeah. just learning about all the different, all the different parts of it and how it all works together. is just is, it makes it sound so, so, so much cooler than, than I actually had thought of it when I first ever read it. Huh. It's really interesting. Cool. You ever watch, you, you would love uh, Barton's, there's a series of Shakespearean workshops on, uh, on YouTube by John Barton. Have you heard of these playing Shakespeare? I've heard of them. Yeah. I, I started one of them and it's, it looked really interesting. Oh man. Yeah. They're great. John Barton is the boss. It's mm -hmm. so good. All, all nine, all nine of those, those workshops are just glorious. Yeah. But yeah. It's very process oriented. It's all about like those great actors who are all with the, the master and they're all trying to figure out how do they best perform the intention of Shakespeare. And they're, they're trying, they're experimenting. And it's such a living organic process. Very, well, he very said, right? huh? He said a lot of people, because he, he was uh, kind of um, the authority of the Royal Shakespeare company in a lot of ways. And everyone wanted for him to write a book on his insights on Shakespeare. And he said, I can't write my insights down like on paper it's an active process of creation and it's my relationship with the actors and the actors relationship to me um in working out the story which will never be exactly acted out every time you know we portray uh hamlet for instance it'll always be a little bit different because there will always be these extra insights from Myself, my, the actors were all challenging each other mm. on how this process, you know, comes about. But there's also the understanding of the certain core uh, truths uh, that Shakespeare, you know, wants the audience to understand. But the, the layers of complexity can always be added on. You know, the fact that psychology wasn't really a field during Shakespeare's time. But now we're very heavily saturated with the uh, concepts of psychology when we're evaluating characters' motivations and things like that. But it works, right? It's not us imposing modernity in, in that sense, like with some of these other plays where it's like all women actors or something like that. And it's about a, a feminist uh, <laughs> um, reason and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the beauty of Shakespeare is that we can we can add complexity onto it without losing that that essence of it. And so Barton um, made those this series instead of writing a book because he said it, it could not be done in the form of a book. Mm -hmm. hmm. But I would like to say that uh, at the time of Shakespeare, there was a very deep psychology, but it was not called psychology because it was a, a part of philosophy. Mm. And uh, mm. psychology became psychology became psychology in the modern sense of the term with Pavlov, with his experiences with the dogs and so on. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the modern psychology for me is not psychology. It's a, it's a branch of biology. Really, is that how it's viewed uh, that, that psychology was started with Pavlov? That's a little bit scary. But that, that, that's quite scary. Because if you, if you look at the word the psychology, psychology is made of psyche and logos, okay? The science or the, or the understanding of the psyche, okay? And the psyche is the epistemological development just under the soul, okay? So the psyche is an inchoate soul or under underdeveloped soul and uh, it's the journey from the psyche to the soul that was uh, the key stuff for the ancient people okay mm. and not the experience on the salivating of dogs <laughs> and uh, and that's true psychology okay because uh, everything uh, 
that happened after Pavlov is rather a quite uh, oversized development of a branch of biology. Very so good point, very good would you, point. Would you say that right now, when people think they're learning psychology, that they're more learning psychology? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not they, they, they don't learn to travel from the psyche to the soul, that's for sure. Mm. And, uh, and uh, that travel in the contemporary mind is more related to spirituality. And it's okay too, okay? If, uh, it's, if it's a went to spirituality or religion, I see no wrong in it. Uh, at the condition that you found a good school for that. Mm. Well, very good point. I was actually repeating what John Barton has said himself in his uh, workshop that psychology didn't exist during the time, but you just blew that out of the water. And that's true. They probably had better insight. And that's so scary that the concept of modern psychology started with Pavlov. Mm. Yes, in terms of technical psychology or brands of, uh, philo uh, not philosophy, but of biology. Even if you read the Bible, okay, when the, the Pharaoh asked Joseph to interpret his dream, okay, the seven, uh, uh, the history of the, the cows, exactly. Thank you, Declan. I know that you are the Bible expert now. And, uh, well, that's psychology. Okay, because uh, Joseph is going into the soul of the pharaohs and was giving an interpretation of his mind. That's psychology. Hmm. Hmm. I want to read that story now. <laughs> That's in yeah. which book? Uh, Genesis? Or, yeah, or the next Genesis, one, Exodus? Yeah. Okay, right. I wasn't sure. End of Genesis or beginning of Exodus? <laughs> yeah, that so sounds like better, that. If you want to know true psychology and you're not too interested by the Indian stuff, better read the, <laughs> the Bible. And, uh, than, uh, than the experience on the dogs and so on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know that, that when I when I took an elective uh, psychology course, they uh, they spent a little bit of time talking about uh, Plato and Socrates for maybe twenty minutes, and then just jumped right over to Wilhelm Wundt, and they were like, "That was the advent of of real psycho uh, psychology when we oh, learned how to like, measure the synaptic behavior of the brain and behavior oh, and feelings." My God. And then that kind of thing make me made me. It's like make nothing me happened in scream. between. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Two thousand years no, of nothing, because, and then we had no, <laughs> the science no, just no, 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 no. On the contrary, on the contrary, uh, there is a progressive uh, uh, degeneracy uh, since the last three centuries uh, in terms of psychology. Okay, uh, yes, there's nothing wrong to know things about the synaptic space and the neurons and the, so on so, and so on. But it's not psychology, it's biology and cybernetics. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 big stuff, the big stuff now is called cognitive science, okay? Because cognitive sciences include uh, neurosciences, cybernetics, uh, even a, a little bit of philosophy, and, uh, but it's more, more on the machine dimension than the true psychological dimension which is once again, the travel from, well, you know, the shortest summary of psychology is book seven of the Republic, okay? The, uh, uh, the allegory of the cave, mm. okay? That's the shortest summary mm. of quality that I know mm. of what is true psychology, okay? Yeah. It's the travel from the shadows to the sun of the absolute. Mm -hmm. And at the middle, you have the psyche. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's perfect. Psychology is the middle station, the number three. Okay, from if we use a Platonic uh, vocabulary of a possibility of six stations. Mm -hmm. If I had to add one thing, because I've been thinking about this uh, as well. I mean, a lot of basic 
psychological truths. I mean, it's not, there's obviously a lot of useful stuff out um, that's been done, but a lot of the basic truths have been known for a very long time. You know, like Lao Tzu uh, famously said, if you're depressed, you're stuck in the past. If you're anxious, you're stuck in the future. Yeah. And if you're in the present, you're happy. Now, mm -hmm. fast forward to cognitive science 2022 and like everything in the last few years, neuroscience, uh, you know, about uh, developing habits and stuff, mindfulness, right? Awareness. It comes down to these same basic things. You know, if you just tell somebody part of why you're depressed is because you're stuck in the past. Um, I mean, there's different strategies to how do you get unstuck from the past, da, da, da. but they've been known and the words have changed, you know, like the, the Greeks, I mean, Aldous Huxley, obviously not the, the best guy, but he had an interesting, uh, he'd given an interesting lecture where he, he was mentioning the terms that the ancient Greeks had, like, uh, you know, there's like a term we don't, or I forget what the term he used, but like if somebody freaks out, right, you say, I don't know what happened, the person seemed possessed, right? They have a word for that, where a daemon comes and sort of takes hold of the person. Today, we would call that an altered state. You know, when somebody's enraged, it's like they press a button and they're just, they're just no longer, they're in an altered state. Um, so they had words for all these things. And even the Stoics, I mean, they had a lot of uh, interesting uh, like mental strategies, you know, for like how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with these things. So a lot yeah. of it is just kind of formalized more and, you know, for yes. various good and bad <laughs> purposes these days. But it's, it's been there. It's just a bit more formalized uh, today. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to know a lot of these truths have been known for a long time and some of them were just rediscovering. Yeah, exactly. And uh, before I forget, Cynthia, next time someone told you, t tells you that uh, there was no psychology in, in the past, <laughs> uh, the major Greek philosophers, uh, when they have their complete uh, system, uh, it's always divided by physics, nature, physics, after that logics, uh, epistemology, psychology, and ethics okay so uh it's even written in the books of the ancient greek philosophers so uh the word was used mm. okay and uh and uh, um uh, i i always have to control myself when some <laughs> idiots uh uh, said that the psychology began at the end of the 19th century. It's not possible. <laughs> well, I, I think this question of know thyself, um, like what, what Schiller even does at the beginning of this, uh, of his first lecture on universal history that we read today, um, it's very much what Socrates is always trying to get at, which is before you, you try to do anything, like go into law or become a you know, he's talking to Alcibiades who wants to be a big political heavy hitter, you know, and all sorts of people have all these ambitions, but they didn't take the time to fully come to know themselves first. You know, they didn't come to discover how their, their minds actually work when they're making discoveries and building a relationship with that part of themselves. So they just go straight to action and then they cause, they cause messes, right, for themselves and for others in the world that they're a part of. And so Schiller's sort of doing the same thing where he's going at for the first 20% of the text. Uh, over what do you want, right? Who are you? Who are you going to choose to be as a student going into the world of a bread scholar, philosophical soul? So come to know yourself. And then by taking that time, you can go into, I'm sure the students he's talking to are not all going to become historians. They're going to become a whole bunch of things. He's, he's speaking to like 300 students, right? And, but whatever you do, you will be able to uh, be the best, right? You'll, you'll exhibit that universality that will make you effective and good and happy and, and you know all of that in any field that you then go into um because that that's how we look at the universe right is through the, the the prism of our own soul that's our own subjective you know and so we can only see the beauty outside of us if we have worked to discover the beauty inside of us and then we could we could just you know make the care the 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 correlation of the objective and the subjective 
Um, whereas somebody who hasn't done that, they'll, it could be like the beauty of, the, of humanity could be like staring them right in the face or the beauty of the universe, right? Of God's creation will be like slapping them in the face and they just can't see it, right? The, the golden section, they could be looking at a, at a spiral galaxy of, you know, indicating the golden section ratio and, and a beautiful flower and they could just look at it and they're like, yeah, everything is just chaotic, random interactions of stochastic act of atoms. There's no purpose. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> It's, it's really it's kind the of The detectives funny. who are investigating the great crime of creation have forgotten about the criminal. Ooh, yeah. that's good. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that's a great place to, uh, I, I like ending on an upbeat note, and I think that's a great place to, to end it for tonight. Um, next week, we'll do the, uh, probably Mission of Moses. I think that's what comes next sequentially um, in his, uh, series on uh, on history and uh we'll also make time dave to uh to end off next week with a little poem by schiller so you, you can have that ready for next week okay yeah no it's perfect we're winding on the right note perfect all right okay. guys good night. good night guys bye oh,